This morning, I'm just talking around Sage CRM, and I just want to give you a flavor of some of the customization options available that help drive user adoption in your business. And the reason that we wanted to talk about this is because experience has taught us over the years that the, the key to a successful CRM implementation, doesn't matter what the technology is, whether it's Sage CRM or Salesforce or ACT or, or whatever it is you're using, but the key to success is user adoption. And you know we, we've seen examples of where much time has been spent designing and configuring the solution, but if users haven't been involved in that process, so if they don't get personal value out of using the system, it, it, it can just fail. So, so we, we have to add personal value for the people that we expect to use the system. And, and this is about the things that can be done to drive that adoption. Um, and it might seem an obvious thing actually, but we, we, we see quite frequently how people adopt almost out of the box configurations of CRM um, and present them to their users. And it means that screens can contain things that are irrelevant, processes aren't particularly well supported, and adoption can be uh, negatively impacted as a consequence. So I just wanted to, to, to throw around some ideas associated with the customization of the CRM system from a from a user interface point of view, and just to remind you how easy it is, in fact, for us to customize the screen layout. So what fields are presented to the users, uh, how the information is, is, is viewed, some customizations that can be easily implemented to control behaviors of those fields as well that, that help guide the user through the process of adding records, editing records, um, by using things like uh, you know mandatory fields, hidden fields, default values, uh, captions to control how field data is presented and various things of that nature. I wanted to touch on workflows and escalations. This is really the powerful core of Sage CRM, the fact that you can set the system up to support your best processes to try and ensure adherence with those best practices that are established in your business and just to eliminate the possibility of um, erroneous data collection and also escalations can help to ensure that opportunities aren't missed. So if we can identify circumstances in which we would ordinarily want to follow up on an opportunity, um, let's say, the system can be used to um, to illuminate those situations to the user and drive that to that follow up action. Um, security and permissions. Uh, security and permissions is a, a very positive thing actually within CRM and, and it is very granular and, and we find often that people aren't aware how granular that security uh, control structure is. So what that means is that you can not, not only use it to protect the data, protect the integrity of the system by removing permissions from people, you, you can actually use permission controls to make the system more, more simple, the user interface more intuitive to users by only showing them data that is relevant to them. Uh, and then the final area I wanted to touch on briefly is add-on components. There are a broad range of very powerful add-ons available with CRM, again, that many people aren't aware of, and more components are being developed on an ongoing basis. Often these are very low cost, very easy to implement, but really bring a lot of value to the system in terms of uh, supporting greater user adoption. So those are the things I wanna to touch on. First of all, in terms of layouts and behaviors, this used to be a, a complex thing to do, but what we can introduce in modern Sage CRM very quickly and easily are what we call client-side scripts. And what they enable us to do is just drop some Java um, JavaScript, some code in the, uh, in, the, in the client side of the CRM system that controls the behavior of the solution. Uh, and it can be used for a multitude of different things. So uh, an example of that is what we call the onChange script. So what onChange script does is looks for a change, uh, the clues in the name, that is made by the user. And in those circumstances, uh, it can invoke a change in the way that the data is presented or the way that the data is recorded. So a simple example, um, such as in this screen, might be where I've got a series of checkboxes. So here these checkboxes are used to record what products and services we offer this client might potentially be interested in. And the checkboxes are then used to drive groups of prospects that um, populate 
email marketing campaigns. So when we add a new prospect, we want to know what products they might be interested in. But in this particular business, that's linked to the industry. So if a prospect falls within a particular industry, it's likely that they'll have an interest in certain products and services that we offer. So uh, an example of client side script would be an unchanged script that says if the user selects, for example, forestry, it automatically populates the checkboxes of the products that are associated with that industry. So again, that's very easy to implement. This part I'm showing you now is the, the customization side of, uh, of um, client side scripts. It isn't something that you would tend to spend a lot of time looking at yourself, but very easy for us to implement these changes on your behalf. So an unchanged script is just some code that's dropped into this panel uh, quickly and easily. This is what the code looks like. It gobbled the gook, I suppose, to, an, to somebody that's not very familiar with Java, but these things are very quick and easy for us to construct uh, to control the behaviors, of, behaviors of, of CRM. So on change script, looking at user entry and then um, using that information to determine the behavior of the system, uh, the way that the data is populated, uh, etc. Uh, we can also use as well as on, on change scripts, there are create scripts and validate scripts. So they work in a slightly different way. A create script can work as soon as a record is created. Uh, and then we can apply various different conditions there to make a field mandatory uh, when a record is added uh, in certain circumstances. So quite a broad, a broad variety of different types of create script. Another one would be uh, maybe hidden. So fields could be um, hidden in certain circumstances. You could have default values in fields. Create scripts could be used to introduce captions. So um, captions might be um, just ways of presenting data to the user. So if, if I just very quickly flick to a say CRM screen, you can see in this example, there's a field called service level. Uh, the way that a create script might be used to control the service level field is if I go into that create script management, I can see that the, the field is actually called SLA. But if we think, well, that SLA isn't very meaningful to a user, uh, they might not inst instantaneously understand that the purpose of that field, we can introduce a caption script that just tells the system to present that to the user as service level. So it's very quick and easy to introduce that. Uh, let's have a look at another example. Uh, you might use uh, a caption create script to introduce some screen visuals that make elements of the system uh, more uh, easy to consume for the user. So if I look back at my product interest example, so this script here is code that controls the way that those checkboxes that we looked at a few moments ago are presented. So in, in the lower half of the screen, I've, I've just put this green box around the edge of them. You can see that not only are they separate from the body of fields above, but they also have the label product interest just above them as well. So it creates a nice kind of cosmetic view that encapsulates all those checkboxes together in one area, just making it easier for the, for the user to consume. So wherever we can, introducing uh, visual elements into the screen, just, just to make the, the interface more intuitive, more relevant and easier to navigate. Workflows and escalations, very, very powerful in CRM, and, and it might be that you're already using these to a degree. There are some standard workflows come with CRM, but they are particularly flexible and configurable, and uh, much can be done with them to support your workflow. The fact that some workflows come with CRM uh, almost kind of undermines the whole concept of it, because what this is really about is not forcing on you workflows and processes that are determined by say CRM. It's very much about looking at the way that your business works, understanding what the processes are that are effective in your business and configuring CRM to support those processes. So this is the back end that you wouldn't normally see that determines how the process around an opportunity might work. Uh, and if I can, let me just use a, a, a pointer, if I can find one. Uh, pointer options, there we go, there's a pointer. So you can see at the top, the process starts with a new opportunity being added, and that's entered at the lead stage. 
Uh, let me just show you on the system where workflow, how workflow looks if you've not used it before. So um, if I just go into an opportunity and workflows can be around opportunities or leads, orders, quotes, etc. On the right hand side, these green hyperlinks are workflow actions. So an opportunity has been added to the system. It's currently at the lead stage, but these are the stages that it might progress to um, as an evolution of the opportunity beyond the lead stage. So if we go back here, sl slightly different example on my screen here. So in my example here, from the lead stage, there's a natural pr progression state which is qualified, uh, or we could go straight to submit a proposal to that client. If we progress to the qualified stage, then from there, the natural progressions may be we submit a proposal or we move on to a negotiating stage or the deal is lost. Uh, let's say we move to the negotiating stage, the progressions from there can lead to, again, we can submit a proposal or the deal is lost or we make the sale. So you can see it's, a, it's, an, it's an hierarchical uh, process map uh, that understands the various different stages and states that the opportunity may flow through from its initial creation to its logical conclusion. And what the workflow does is invites the user to determine what the current stage is. And as they advance from one to the next, it can invoke a series of actions and reactions uh, and notifications, uh, requests for data collection, etc. So the, um, the actions can include a broad variety of things. It might be that as we advance from one stage to the next, we're asked to populate a, a field with some information uh, and the field is mandatory at that point. So it might be that we have an approximate forecasted value for the opportunity. When we add the opportunity at the early stage, at the lead stage perhaps, maybe we don't know what the value is because we've not qualified it yet, but when we progress to the qualified stage, there's an assumption that at that point we do have some sense of what that opportunity is worth. So maybe we pop a, a field on the screen for the user to update with an approximate forecast value and make that field mandatory at that point. So it's not mandatory as soon as the opportunity is created, but just at the point in time through that process where it becomes relevant. So we can ask the user or require the user to collect information as they progress through the uh, opportunity workflow. We can um, show the messages on the screen that, that help them to understand what they need to do next. Um, we can use workflow actions to create follow up tasks and appointments in the CRM diary. We can use workflow to create opportunities in certain circumstances. Mine is an opportunity workflow here, but if it were a workflow around a lead, there might be a point in the lead workflow at which, that, at which point that lead has become properly qualified and then an opportunity is generated as a consequence. We can use workflows for cases as well as, of course. Um, so we can create things like cases and leads through workflows as well. We can create mail merge documents in uh, in Word or PDF as stages of the work workflow. And we're not constrained just to these out of the box actions. You, you can also introduce stored procedures and SQL statements that do very specific things uh, as the user navigates through the workflow. So again, it's not about getting you to work the way that CRM works. It's about sitting down with you to understand exactly what the, the processes are that are effective in your business and setting the workflow up to support those processes. So what we're really doing is supporting the users, making their life easy, guiding them through the process one step at, uh, at a time, helping them to ensure that they don't miss a step, they don't um, neglect to carry out any particular um, investigation or data gathering or, or approval step or anything that's important to uh, process adherence. So it's making sure that things happen as they should happen, but it's supporting the user in making their lives easy in, in that adherence process as well. And the escalation side uh, is, is similar, except that escalations run automatically. So whereas workflows are triggered when a user clicks a workflow action hyperlink in the lower right hand corner of the screen, as I showed you a moment ago, escalations are more dynamic. So escalations are where you determine the logic um, of, uh, of what a scenario might be. And then when 
those circumstances manifest themselves in the CRM system, an action can be automatically invoked. This is just an example of some of the standard escalations that are included in CRM. So you'd have to kind of drill in to see what they do. Here's one called unassigned opportunity. So that might be invoked automatically if an opportunity has been added to the system, but not assigned to a particular sales user. High value opportunity one uh, will look at where an opportunity has changed its status from in progress to closed one and it's above a certain value. So you can determine what the characteristics are that trigger the escalation and then go on to determine what happens in those circumstances. So just looking a little more closely at a specific example, uh, this one here third from the top is opportunity close date approaching. And again, looking at the back end, you wouldn't normally expect to see this as a, as a user. But what we would do is create a trigger SQL clause. And again, I'm, I'm, I apologize for the for the gobbledygook on screen before you. I'm not expecting you to uh, understand what that trigger clause is saying if you're not familiar with JavaScript. But the clause is something that we can create quickly and easily to determine those circumstances. And this clause is looking for um, situations where the logged on user um, has an opportunity that is currently in progress at a certain stage of the workflow and is uh, due to close within the, the next few days, so within a, a short period of time. So the SQL clause determines what opportunities in this particular example are affected and what user and then down in the bottom, the escalation action determines what action shall take place in those circumstances. And you'll see in the type at the bottom, it says show notification on screen. So if I just move it on to the next bit, you'll see in this panel, this is where we customize how the notification appears on screen. I've highlighted UK translation because, again, if you have a, a global distributed solution and we have different people in different languages and different geographical territories using the same system, we can support that as well. But if you look in the text there, it says opportunity close date approaching opportunity and then within some um, some hash marks up or description that's the description of the opportunity i.e the name of that opportunity and then the close date uh, also in hash marks at the end so the notification that the user will see on screen includes the description of the opportunity and also the target close date so if we move on to the next bit uh, this is how it appears to the user on screen. So in the top right hand corner, there's a notification icon. And um, this is how the uh, the text might appear. Opportunity close date approaching. The opportunity is called training services and the close date is 30th of June 2020. Uh, the next area that I want to look at quickly is user permissions and preferences. There's a, a very um, uh, granular security model within the CRM system that allows us to control how uh, users can interact with the system. And it's, it's often used to restrict users from doing things. And we sometimes think of it as protecting the data, protecting the integrity of the system by not allowing users to uh, edit or delete records that we wouldn't want them to interact with or even view certain records. But it's also really useful to uh, support user buy-in because often users, when they log into CRM, only really want to see elements of the system that are of value to them. They only want to see uh, records that are significant to them. And you can see, looking at the matrix above, this is a typical um, user profile matrix um, that we could deploy. And you can create as many of these profiles as you like for different users and types of users. Uh, and in each case, we can look at the entity cases, communications, companies, leads, et cetera, et cetera, and determine whether that user has the ability to view records in that entity, edit them or delete them. So they can be individual per user per entity, but also reflecting the relationship between the user and the record that we're that we're you know that we're considering. So it might be that uh, if I'm a salesperson, for example, where there's an opportunity, I can view, edit and delete opportunities where those opportunities have been assigned to me or created by me. But I might apply different permissions in circumstances where an opportunity has not been created by me and not assigned to me. So in those situations, I might allow the user to view that opportunity 
but not edit it and certainly not delete it. So if you think about the, the connotations that you can apply around that, it, it could be very granular. There are also a broad range of preferences that we can select for users. They can select some of these preferences themselves, but also we can control these preferences centrally to determine the presentation of the system on screen. So CRM can actually look very different to different users depending on their security level. So if I go back to my system here, I'm, I'm logged on as an administrator and you can see I can see everything. So lots of drop down menus, my CRM, team CRMs. I can see all details of reports, marketing functions. So a broad range of functionality accessible through the menus. I can go on and add all sorts of records, including companies and solutions and cases, etc. A broad variety of things. But if I was to log off and log on as uh, a simple uh, sales user, for example, with a different profile, the presentation of CRM can appear very differently. So you can see here I'm looking at, uh, let's go back to look at a company record. The menu structure is very different. All I've got is my CRM. I can see the world according to me. I can see my calendar, my opportunities, but I don't have visibility of anything else. If I go to the add button, it's a slimmed down feature set. I can add opportunities and people and companies and quotes, etc. but I can't add cases. I can't add solutions. Uh, and, and, and such like. So the presentation of the system can be entirely different depending on the user profile uh, and, and who that individual user is. So a lot of flex around security uh, within CRM as well. Okay, the, um, the last area that I wanted to touch on was add-on components. So we are able to develop various customizations to introduce different functionality in CRM to support user buy-in. But there are lots of off the shelf tools that you can buy as well. Uh, I just wanted to show you some examples of some new components that have been introduced fairly recently. These are all easy to deploy, very powerful, uh, but low cost as well. So when I say low cost, you're talking typically about five or 10 pounds a month. You know, I'm talking about low cost add-ins that add a significant level of extra functionality and value to CRM. So postcode lookup, let me just show you how that would work. So this is a very, very often requested feature within CRM, but not been available in this form until very recently. So if I'm adding a company record and I want to introduce an address, of course, there could be multiple addresses. So I've chosen a company here that already has two. I'm going to add another one. So new address. And what I can do is just type in a postcode, click the tab key, and I'm presented with a list of addresses in that postcode area. I can make my selection and it populates the address fields really quickly, really neatly, really easily. It also has the capability of recognizing whether it's a, a, a business or a, a, a domestic address. So if I put in uh, NG7 uh, or B, I'll see these are the businesses. So uh, in, I'm looking for Sherwood House, which is where our, our Nottingham office is based as part of uh, Page Kirk. So I can select the business from there and the address is populated similarly. So you can see it's, the, the beauty of it is it's quick, it's easy, uh, it's intuitive. It won't take a, a user long to, uh, to get to grips with that feature, but very, very powerful. Another example uh, that I wanted to mention briefly is the quick quote order feature. Now, we do have a lot of customers that use the, the quote and order creation facilities within CRM. And that's become more popular in these days where many of our Sage CRM users have their systems integrated with either Sage 50 or Sage 200. So what they're doing is creating quotes within Sage CRM, converting those quotes to orders, and then pushing those orders through to Sage 50 as orders or invoices. Um, so uh, one of the limitations has been the creation of quotes or orders requires you to build up the line items on a one at a time basis. And it's been a bit uh, a bit clumsy, to say the least. So I'd go over to new line, line item on the right hand side. I, I can use these find features to um, to locate the product that I want to include. Let's go for a 10 gigabyte hard drive. I can put in the quantity uh, and the price. And then I can do save and new, and I have to wait for the screen to refresh, and I have to go through that same process again uh, if I want to find another product to add. 
So it's OK, but uh, if I'm doing more than one or two line items, it can be quite consuming. And uh, you know, add a lot of time to the process. If I'm, I'm raising a lot of quotes, a lot of orders through the course of the day, all that time together, it, it's a lot of time wasted. It's a lot of wasted effort. So the, the quick quote uh, function uh, just provides another means by which to uh, capture data within quotes and orders by presenting the line items all together in one screen that I can manipulate without having to create one, save it, create another, save it. So you can see I've just got this green plus down at the bottom there. Thank you. I can do a search on the product or the description. Um, so if I wanted that hard disk, I can just begin to type HAR. If I want to add another one in, let's say I wanted a monitor, I can just begin to type. It searches immediately and gives me a list of the product. Whether I'm searching by product code or the description of the product, it will pick it up. It reintroduces the list price, the quoted price. I can amend if I want to. Uh, and of course, I can change the quantities as well if I want to. So really quick to build up a quotation, introducing line items simultaneously. And I can also introduce um, uh, like S1s, like free text items. So if I type in some stuff, blah, 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 whatever it might be, the system recognizes that this is not a product within the standard product list. So it assumes it's going to be a free text item. I can put in my quoted price. It assumes it's a free text item, as you can see on the right hand side, and that'll just push through to, if I'm sending that to Sage 50, it will turn up as an, as an S1 item. Um, I can also add uh, uh, column headers, if you like, or, or descript message lines, if I want a message line to appear in the invoice or the order, which you couldn't do in standard CRM. Uh, I could uh, I could type in something in the description field, and because there's nothing in the product or the price, the system assumes that that is merely a message line or or a comment. Uh, maybe I want that comment to appear at the top uh, before the rest of the line items. So using the the little burger um, icon on the far right hand side, I can just drag that up to the top. So you can manipulate line items really easily. So add them in any order and then just drag them around to fit them where you want them to appear. So again, a really nice user interface that makes a significant difference to users that are adding quotes and orders where there could be multiple line items. It can save a lot of time and a lot of effort. Lots of different add-ons like that available. Other ones include scheduled reports, and I thought I'd mention that because that's something that we're very frequently asked for. So you can create uh, dashboards and reports within Sage CRM, but they're kind of reactive in that the user has to remember to go and look at those reports in order to consume their content. Whereas it might be that I create a perhaps a, a sales report and I think it's important for the user to see that sales report every Monday morning to draw attention to the sales they're currently working on. So I can schedule that as a report. So we're using standard Sage CRM reports, but actually scheduling them to be distributed by email as a PDF or a link to that report uh, on a predetermined schedule. So those are just two or three examples of, again, low cost but high impact um, components that can be introduced into CRM to add value, specifically in supporting the user in getting more from the system, because you know that's the whole theme, I, I suppose, of the, um, of, the, uh, of the conversation during this session is, what can we do to make the system more intuitive to individual users? What can we do to secure that buy-in? Because when we secure that buy-in, we get value returned to the business. We get a return on investment. If we don't get user buy-in, if they're not happy using the system, if they don't feel personally supported, then that's where the problems start to occur.